How is everyone this morning? Let's worship together. Come to the waters, you who thirst, and you'll thirst no more. Unto the Father. Come to the Father, you who work, and you'll work no more. All you First time with us this morning. I want to draw your attention to our connection card. Uh, we we just want to know that uh, that you were here this morning, and uh, we're not going to stop by and and uh, um, and embarrass you at your home anyway, or, or pop in unexpected. Um, but we just we just want to be able to send out an email or card to you this week, just 
just uh, just thank you for being here this morning. And, and also for our church family, our, this, this is something they, they use to communicate with us as staff and, and uh, prayer requests or, or needs that in their lives that are going on. So we encourage you to do that as well as you feel so inclined. Um, um, also, if this is your first time uh, here this morning, we just want to send out a special welcome to you. Uh, uh, the, feel free to continue to fill your coffee cup or, or grab a, another donut. Just follow the exit sign out and, and, and you can get out that way. Um, also, we are continuing our series of our Gospel Revolution series. Um, it's been, been an awesome awesome week in, in our series through our small groups and I just want to encourage you if you haven't had a, con a chance to connect to a small group yet um, it's still not too late and, and also if you haven't had a, a chance to grab a book they are they are over here um, and we, we encourage you to pick one of those up um, as well and also with the with the small groups if you haven't had a chance to connect uh, see one of us uh, Pastor Tony Pastor John Shoot us, a, shoot us a message this week. We want to. We want to get you, get you next to a to a small group. Um, just just r take a real quick opportunity. Last night we had a, had our first annual Valentine's banquet, and some of. Oh, thank you, thank you. We we had a great turnout uh, uh, last night. Um, had a great time of fellowship and worship, and and um, uh, Pastor Owen came out and, and provided a devotion for us last night and. It was just an awesome time in, in God's house to fellowship, and, and um, we, 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 encourage, we encourage you to be praying about next year. We're, we're praying, through, praying through next year already, and uh, we're still trying to recover from last night, but, but we're, trying to, we're, we're, we're thinking ahead as well. So, so thank you so much for those who came out, and, and we know the ones who weren't able to make it were thinking, thinking about us and praying for us as well. Okay. With that said, just find a couple people that you haven't had a chance to talk with this morning and welcome this morning. Jesus is the Christ, the Savior. 
of the sun. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way through the grave is overcome. Jesus is the from your heart to love, oh God, to slay for us.
want to share a new song with you guys and invite you to sing along with us as you learn.
as you bow your head, just still yourself and focus your hearts in the, to the throne. But while you're doing that, I, I would invite you to think about right now, place in your mind that person that is in your life that, that you just deeply love. Maybe a wife, maybe a husband, could be a child, could be a mom or dad, friend, a brother or sister. Whether you're, you're here in this congregation or you're watching us on the iCampus, as you visualize that person, you're thinking of that face and just the passion that evokes and just the outpouring of love that you feel, just even thinking about that person, pray for them right now. Pray for Christ's grace to be exposed to them. Pray that God's blessings would be shown to them. Pray that they would experience the love of God. And then pray that, that uh, maybe they're in the middle of something right now that God would deliver, God would speak. And Father, we approach you as a congregation. We come before your throne of grace, God. And, and we uh, recognize here as we're in this season, this Valentine season, this, this time that we think of love and specifically focus on love for one another. And uh, Lord, we pray. We pray for each other, God. And we pray as your word commands us that we lift our brothers, our sisters to you. And God, may your grace be known to us today. May you, uh, a, a, may, may you just shine in our lives. May we see who you are and what you want to do in our lives today. May God, I ask this teaching, uh, this, uh, this time of coming into the word and thinking of the things of God, would that be a time that we walk away being amazed at you, that we would experience, uh, we, we would experience your passion for us, your love for us, and in that process, we would be thrown into your passion, God. These things we pray in Christ's strong and powerful name. Amen. Hey, you go ahead and be seated, and I uh, want to welcome you. I also want to mention that uh, that I was at a, a part of the, uh, Dan and I were part of the Valentine's Day banquet yesterday, and uh, hear me, hear me clearly, this is not some pastor trick to make those who were not there feel guilty, um, but I'm going to say this, those of you who were not there, you, you missed out on a great time. I mean, it was a really good time. Uh, it's time that blessed us, a time that challenged us, a time that uh, we as a church came together and just got to know one another a bit better. But also we as husbands and wives and friends and family could come together and get to know one another better as well. And in the midst of that, uh, you know, we played a game. Uh, Dave and I, uh, we were part of the uh, newlywed game, uh, not so newlywed game. It was a couples game. And I tell you what, even... Even, you know, my median age that I am, you're never too old to learn new things. And so one of the things I've learned as a result of that game is that when asked, it, now, now here's the thing, I was told uh, later after the fact that I was asked, if you could marry someone in Hollywood, who would it be? Now, now that, for, okay, there right there is a bad choice of word. Words are important. I heard, I didn't hear if you could marry someone. I heard if you had to. You know, if you were forced to marry someone in Hollywood, who would it be? And I learned that the right answer is, the right answer is, I would not marry anyone. I have the perfect wife. That's the right answer. Now, I'm not going to tell you what I wrote because those of you who didn't come, you should have came. So there you go. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, but I realized, I realized that I am kind of behind uh, now. I'm, I'm having to do makeup now uh, in Valentine's Day. And see, on top of it, it's kind of a double whammy for the Turner family because Dana's birthday is the day before Valentine's Day. So, boy, a lot on the line. And so I recognized with last night's experience that I got some makeup to do. I have to, I have to really work hard. And so one of the things I have done is uh, I, I got a prototype here. Now, we took a vote in the first hour because Dana was in the first hour. She is here today, so, so you know we're going to have to be a little more discreet about this. But after, after service, I'm just asking everyone here, what do you think? Does this, uh, does this help me? Is this the right direction to do something like this? And I realize it's one thing to see beautiful flowers from a distance. It's another thing to experience the flowers. So, Kenny, where are you? Where's Kenny at? There he is, Kenny. So, I uh, asked Kenny if he would take this. And I want you all to, I want you to smell it. I want you, you know, texture's important. Touch them. 
uh, just experience this bouquet, okay? And and I, there's no trick, you know. There's not a, there's not a bee in there. There's no there's not, not, nothing I'm trying to do to create a point here, okay? So don't be thinking, oh, what's going to happen? I just want you to experience that. Kenny's going to go from section to section, and when he's done, he's going to place the flowers over here. Uh, so you know that's that's what we're going to do. Um, and and. I'm going to continue to preach while he's doing that. So I think we can multitask. I think we can handle handle taking care of that. Um, what I want to do is last week, Pastor Mike, or Pastor John started out. He started out teaching us about the gospel and what the gospel is and how the gospel is not religion. It's not outward focus. It's not us fixing ourselves to come before the presence of God. And, and so today, kind of the natural response for me is as I look at the reality of that, I just say, Wow, this is something to be in amazement of. I stand amazed at when I think of the gospel of Jesus Christ, when I think of that. And I recognize that I, and the reason I stand amazed is because Pastor John really did uh, bring out a response in me uh, last week where I recognize that, that there is this prevalent thought in our world today. There's this prevalent attitude in the churches today that I have to become better before I can become godly. I have to, before God can appreciate me, before he can love me, before he can care for me, there's this thought process that goes something like, I have to get my junk in order. I have to be good for God to like me. I have to be good for God to love me. You know, and, and, I, and it goes all across the board. I mean, let's face it, all of us here, if we were being honest, 100% of people would raise their hands if I'd say, have you ever felt that way? That in order for God to accept you, in order for God to love you, you have to get your junk in order. You have to make yourself a better person. If we were honest people, all of us would raise our hands. I'll confess to you that there have been times in my life where I have avoided doing a quiet time. I have avoided in the past opening up my Bible and, and listening to God. I confess that there have been times where my prayer life would become dismal for a period of time because I would be so overwhelmed with a sense of personal sin or a sense of, of that I just failed God in some incredible way. And because of that, if I pray to him, I'm going to be standing in the face of an angry dad who's going to disapprove of me. And who's going to tell me that I'm bad and how disappointed he is. And so I would just rather not have that confrontation. So I'll just not pray. You know? Now, I'm, I'm not saying that going, no, that's the way to go. That's the, that's the thing to do. Pastor Tony does. It should never. No, I'm saying that's, that's uh, I, I, that, that, oh, that, I've so messed that up. I remember a while back ago, and by a while back ago, I'm talking about years ago. I mean, over a decade ago. So don't think, oh, this must be someone in the church today, so who could this story be about? No, this was about 12 years ago. I was a youth pastor at Southgate Baptist, and there was a lunch I was having with a, with a man, and, and I was, I, he was very far from God. He was, he was not a follower of Christ. He was not a member of the church. He was someone who I had a, a relationship with, a connection point to. We're having lunch together. I am sharing the gospel to him. I am giving him the good news of Jesus Christ. Gospel simply means the words good news. I'm sharing about the good news of Christ. And his response to me was, Tony, I can't argue with it. Boy, it sounds great. And it sounds like, it sounds like something I want, but not yet. Not yet. I, I can't do it because I am right now in just some crazy living, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm partying every night, and if, and, and, and I got, and I don't want to give that up, and plus, God, God just doesn't want me with that frame of mind, so not yet, not yet. And so I invited him, my counter was, well, hey, dude, why don't you come to church with me? Would you just come to church for a time and surround yourself with some people? Surround yourself with some God fears. And you know what? Maybe being around them, you're going to change your mind. You're going to recognize that, that this life is better. The one that I'm telling you about is better than the one you have. And his response to me was this. He said, I can't do that because I've, I know that in order for me to go to church, I have to stop doing some things. In order for me to be involved on a Sunday morning worship experience with, with good people, I have to become good. What a false teaching that is. What a false thought. And you know what? There's nothing new about that, is there? There's nothing new about that thinking. Matter of fact, the Gospels, if we look in the book of Matthew, we see this exact same story, this exact same thought process happening. In Matthew chapter 9, uh, the story goes that Jesus is new in his ministry, 
and, and he comes across a tax collector. Okay? Now, this tax collector's name is Matthew. And, and you've got to understand now, today, in this day and age, okay, yeah, probably a tax collector isn't necessarily our favorite person in the world, you know? I have a feeling probably in the next few years we will probably be a little more angry when we think about IRS and tax collectors, probably more likely when I see things headed. But, but I'll tell you, for me personally, I don't have this visceral reaction when I think of the IRS, right? I just I think of more of a, uh, but but in Jesus' day, when you talked about tax collectors, you would get, uh, you would tense up your body, you would hate these people because not only were they tax collectors, they were sellouts to your family. These were people that rejected their faith. Oftentimes, they rejected the laws of God. They rejected Israel, and they sold out to this foreign pagan country known as Rome, this empire known as Rome, and they were cheats and swindlers, and they were scandalous, and you hated them. You were angry at them. And what does Jesus do? He comes to one of them and says, follow me. And Matthew got out of his cubicle, quit collecting his taxes, and he followed Jesus. And shortly thereafter, Matthew gets all of his friends together and says, you guys got to meet this dude. This holy man wants to be around us. He likes us. He, he wants to speak in our lives. And so the, Matthew 9 talks about this party that Matthew threw in which all of his tax collector friends came, and they invited their friends. Well, guess what? The friends of tax collectors are bad people too, right? You know, these people are the lowest of the low. They are the cheats. They are the cutthroats. They are the ones out there that are getting things done that the law can't, you know, the, the law doesn't want to recognize. They are the prostitutes. They are the people that no one, no good Bible-believing Jew would want to be around. And so the, the, the story says that here Jesus is with these people, and it sounds like, from the context of this, he's having a good time with them. You know, he's not there just saying, oh, Lord, just protect me. I'm just doing this to show your grace. I'm just trying, just trying to get through to show how holy I am so maybe I can draw one of these holy people my way. No, it seems like Jesus is having fun with these people. And so what happens on the outskirts, on the outskirts of this uh, party, are the holy people, the religious elite. And, and they're murmuring, and they're whispering. And at some point, they pull away some of Jesus' followers, and they're saying, what kind of teacher is this guy? We thought he's the Messiah. He says he's a Messiah. He says he's this righteous person, but why is he hanging out with sinners? Jesus, his demeanor was not the kind of person to go, oh, I just heard that, and I'm just going to let it go, you know. I don't need to waste my time on them. No, he stops the party. He shuts down the turntable. He grabs a microphone. He, and he decides he's going to lay down a beat, right? He's going to talk about truth now. And he says to them, and I'll just read it to you rather than describe it to you. In Matthew 9, uh, verse 12, he says, On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, Jesus says. But I've come to call the sinners. To call the sinners. Let's just stop right there. To let that soak in. Jesus did not come for the righteous. He came for those who need him. The sinners in this world. That is the gospel. This week, I hope I hope you're in a small group. I love my small group so much. We we just started a new group, and, and some some of the people in our group are people that we've been with for years, and there's a couple of folks, a couple of families in our group that are brand new to our group, and 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 just it's just so fun and just great. And one of the things I I was reminded of, and we were able to talk about it. So often we get caught up in the word the gospel, good news. You know what is that? How do you define the good news? How do you find the gospel? And more often than not, most Christians are like, oh, big question there. I don't know. It's so much. Here's what the gospel is, just so that we have, just so that we are all speak in the same language here, okay? The gospel is simply the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. The gospel is the, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, and that he did those to secure us a relationship with God. He did those to, to pay our sin debt. He did that so that we would be made in right relationship with God. Quite simply, that's the gospel. That's the gospel there. 
Now, see, the reason why it's, it's important for us to remind ourselves what the gospel is is because we constantly get this pressure just I, from the world, from maybe just kind of who we are, just some, some of our inside stuff. We, we get constantly pulled into thinking that the gospel is that you have to get your act together for God to accept you. That's what we think the gospel is. That's how we so often live like the gospel is, that as long as I get my act together, then God can like me, God can love me, God can accept me. But the gospel is not that. The gospel is not that. It is not getting the act together. Can you bring the roses up? I don't see the roses. I need them now, buddy. Um, bring them up here. So And just set them on the, pe the pencil for me. So I remember a time where I was in college at the time. It was called South. It was a little school called Southwest Missouri State University. Oh, my. Oh, uh, wow. That, I don't know. I guess I know what you all think of flowers now. Um, well, I was at Southwest Missouri State University. Uh, now it's called MSU. And, and periodically there was a preacher that would come. His name was Jed. I don't know his last name. Uh, he'd come, and of course, uh, and he would go into the, the, the quad area, and draw. always a crowd would be drawn, and I would be one of those people. There would be anywhere from 40 people to, you know, several hundred people surrounding this guy. And uh, for Jed, it was very important to, to make sure everyone knew about their personal sin. You know, he didn't think that we were aware of it on our own. And so one time, he, he did this little trick where he threw a, a rose. He, talked about, he pulled out a perfect rose, and he smelled it, and he talked about how perfect it was. And he threw it out of the audience and said, everyone needs to experience the beauty of this rose. And asked everyone to pass it around, much like I did today, much like I was doing with you. And, and then he goes on now, what has to be in my thought process, and now I've had, oh, golly, um, 96 was when I graduated. So, you know, however long that was, about 20, 20 years, 20 whatever, you know, just almost 20 years uh, to think about this. And, and it, it has to be the worst. He gave the worst diatribe on sexuality, on sexuality, and on, on what, what the Bible says sexuality was. It was fear-mongering. It was, oh, you, yeah, you're having a party now, but when the warts appear, that's when the party stops. Uh, it, was, it was just craziness at some point. You, you know, pointing out girls that, had, that was chewing gum and saying, because you're chewing gum, you're a whore. And just, and just saying those kinds of things. And, 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 and he was enraging people, you know, getting people angry. But then there's a point where it just all of a sudden stopped. And he said, he, and, and what it was was the flower came back to him. And it was just like this, right? It was destroyed. It, the petals were gone. They were broken. They were crushed. He, he said, who would want a rose like this? And you know what? He cut to the quick. He made his point. And those ladies and those men were silenced. And he began to say about how you are a destroyed flower because you're sluts and you're whores and you're perverts. And he, he started just breathing. You know, it's like he now had the upper hand. And he just starts pounding away at people. And he said, who could love a flower like this? Who could have a scarred flower and want to prize that? Who would want that? And I sit back now with these some 20 years of thinking about that story, and I realize the truth is, who would want a flower like this? Jesus wants a flower like this! It's what he wants. Jesus came for that flower. He didn't come for the perfect rose. He didn't come for the one that had their act together. It was Jesus that came for that kind of flower in your life and my life. And oh, I apologize for yelling, folks. I don't want to be the red-faced preacher that shouts and screams, but there are some things in this life that are worthy of shouting about, and this truth is one of them, that the gospel is Jesus didn't come for the person that has their act together. Jesus didn't come for the perfect person. He didn't come for the one that knows no sin. He came for the most broken. He came for the most despised. He came for those who are scarred and seared and torn apart in life. He came for the diseased and the wretched. Those are the people that Jesus came from. Who would want that kind of rose? Jesus would want that kind of rose. I know it. And the, the scriptures are faithful and true to show it time in and time out again. So what's the problem? 
Why do we just naturally move into Jed's kind of thinking? We've got to have the perfect rose. We've got to guard that rose. We've got to protect it because how in the world could God ever want anything less than that? Why do we move to that? And I've discovered, I, I'm convinced it's because we get the order wrong. We get the order wrong in life. You say, what are you talking about, Tony? This is a conversation. This is a teaching time now, folks. Uh, not preaching. I'm not going to be preaching at you. I'm te we're teaching. So one of the things, if you're in this congregation, chances are at some point, <laughs> at some point, you, uh, you, you've had this conversation with me or with Pastor John, Pastor Mike, or maybe a small group leader. Now, not everyone here, but many of you have had this conversation. It starts off like this. Tony, uh, I just, I don't understand what's going on inside of me right now, um, but God is doing something I feel. I am feeling things that maybe I've never felt before, or maybe, oh, I felt these things when I was a kid or a long time ago, but it seems like God has reawakened some things inside of me, and I really don't know what to do with them. And what that does, that conversation begins us going down a road where we're either Either uh, these people are coming to accept the grace of Jesus for the very first time, and they're giving their lives to Him. To they're inviting Him to be their to be for Jesus to be their Lord and Savior for the very first time. Or in some cases, it might be just a case where a person has strayed; they've gone away, they've forgotten the gospel, they've forgotten the things of God, and they've just gotten caught up in the busyness of life and in the and doing family and all that kind of stuff. And they've fought, they've forgotten about the that grace that they were exposed to a long time ago. And so for them, it's just more of a renewal. It's more of a, hey, uh, God, I'm coming back. I forgot. I've, I have strayed. I've erred. I'm sorry, God. And, and so when we have that conversation, it's not on my mind to go, okay, okay, time out. Stop. Forget about what you just told me. Let's straighten you out theologically. You said you don't know what's going on. Let me, let, let me define that for you theologically. I'm not too concerned about you winning a theological argument on a seminary campus one day with a professor uh, what I'm, I'm more interested in, when, when someone says, I don't really know what's going on inside of me, but I feel like God is doing something, I just start, we, let's just start right there, and let's just talk, okay? But now what we're going to do is, for those of you that have had that conversation with me, now I'm going to help educate what are, so that you go, okay, these were the things that God was doing. Because uh, what he's doing was putting you on a path of salvation. Now, let me make it very clear. That when I say that, you immediately might think, oh, path, that means it takes like long time for salvation to occur. No, no, I'm not saying that. Because the truth of the matter is this. Salvation, here, here's a statement I make that is true. I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. That is a true statement there. I have been saved in that there was a time when I was a boy that I recognized uh, the, the truth that I'm a sinner and that I'm lost and undone and I need Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. And so as a child, as a young man, I prayed to receive Christ into my life. I invited Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I asked him to forgive me of my sins. I invited him into my life to be the owner, the boss of me. And, and so I was saved at that very moment. I was saved from myself. I was saved from sin. I was saved from, from hell. I was saved from, and, and from eternal death. You know, I was saved from that. But I'm being saved in that every day, every day, I wake up and I have to make a choice in my life. Of, will I put Jesus on the lordship of my life? Will I put him on the throne of my heart? Or am I going to choose this day to make bad decisions and bad consequences that have bad consequences? Am I going to choose this day to live for myself or live for God? And so every day I depend upon his Holy Spirit to, to ignite with me a passion to do the things of God. I, I am being saved every day. He is making a difference in my life. Uh, I will be saved, meaning one day I will either no longer draw breath or he will return and I will not be on this earth. Uh, and and I, th that's the truth, folks. The reality is this world, one way or another, is going to end for you. I know we don't like to think it. I don't care. There's, you can't, out, you can't out-supplement the Lord, okay? You're not going to take so many supplements and so many vitamins that you're going to have eternal life. Uh, I don't care how many oxygen tents you choose to sleep in. You're not, you're not going to do that. I don't care how many CPAP, what the best CPAP machine is that you're putting on your face. You're going to die one day. Okay? Uh, you're going to be face to face with God. And, and at that point, I trust that he will save me into his kingdom. I have been saved. I am being saved. And I will be saved. And that one day, I'm going to be walking in the kingdom of God physically with this body. It's not just some ethereal principle, some philosophy that I live out. It's a real life kind of thing that I will be saved. And so this, it, it, it speaks of like process here, doesn't it? It speaks of process. And so when, when I hear someone say, God's doing something in me, 
but I don't really understand it. Well, let me help you understand what happened in the past for you. Or maybe there's someone in this room that it's happening right now for you. There's a process of God introducing himself. And the first step is called, the, I call it the calling. It's the calling stage. This is the stage in, in which the Holy Spirit, uh, through maybe through the word, or maybe through another believer, or through life circumstances, or through a commercial, or through just, who knows? God can use so many different ways, but God uses a, a, something to introduce Jesus Christ to you. you you're introduced to, to, the, to the person of Jesus. And by being introduced to the person of Jesus, pretty quickly, conviction of sin follows. You recognize that I am broken, I am lost, I am undone, I need help. Now, it's interesting because we as 20th century Americans, we tend to kind of, we tend to downplay the conviction of sin thing, don't we? Uh, you know, some people will talk about Jesus being kind of like a self-help guru. Well, I have a good life now, but uh, I can have a better life with Jesus. You know, okay, I kind you know, with Jesus I can be more fulfilled. I can understand people more. But, you know, the reality is, is when we see Jesus for who he is, we see who we really are. And who we really are is a pretty bad picture. Pretty bad picture. And we become convicted of our sin. And out of that, as that happens, we go into this phase uh, that a good word that I use for it is, is the redemption phase. Now, there's a lot, of, a lot of theological terms here that I don't mean to be thrown and confused. But in this redemption phase, redemption means to redeem. You redeem a coupon. You're, you're taking this coupon and getting money for this coupon, in essence. You're buying back something. And so during this redemption phase, what we're talking about is Jesus, God, buying you back. And during this time, things are happening. Things that, you know, again, this is, the, this is really the confusing part where you're like, I feel like something's happening. I just don't understand what's going on. Well, during this experience, you're, during this time, you're experiencing the atonement, the atonement of Christ. You're, you're, you know, and that, that is the idea that that's a spiritual term. That's a theological term that's talking about uh, basically someone covering over you. Someone putting blood, uh, in the case of uh, the Jews, they talk about atoning sacrifices, meaning you would shed, you'd kill an animal, and the blood that was presented at the altar would wash over your sins, is what the Jews understood. And so, so when Jesus shed his blood, that sacrifice was atoning us. It was paying for our sin, is what they, those writers and, and those, those people understood. Uh, so atonement was occurring. Regeneration was occurring. The idea, regenerate, okay, that's talking about bringing something that was dead back to life. The idea is you are spiritually dead. Apart from Christ, you are a dead man. You are a dead woman walking, you know, because of sin. And so now the Spirit of God through the salvation process is bringing regeneration, bringing you back to life. Now notice I'm talking a lot. These are a lot of things about what God is doing in salvation. And I hope what you're hearing there is I hope you're sitting back going, well, it sounds like you're putting a lot of this on God, Tony. That's right, I am. I am, because guess what? In salvation, God does the heavy lifting. God does the heavy lifting. You are not doing stuff to earn God's favor. You are not working so that God could save you. Now, here's the part during this redemption process that, that we, we partner with God in. There's acceptance here. Uh, uh, during this point, as I'm going, oh, oh, you're saying Jesus died on a cross for me? And, and because he shed his blood and because he was buried and he rose from the dead, because of that, that paid my sin debt? I accept that. I, I, yes, yes. I, I want that in my life, too. I, I, I will take that. I, I will take that gift. I, will, I, I bring that into my life. That's acceptance there. And that's something we do. When, when we hear the message of atonement and of regeneration, we can't just say, oh, well, Jesus atoned for everyone. Okay, then that's fine. I'm moving on now. No, no, you become affected by it if it's taken hold in your heart and you accept it. And then there's also repentance. That's, again, like I said earlier, that's a word we don't like to talk about because that implies that we're doing something wrong. And that's right. We are. As, as sinners, I, I come during this point going, oh, God, you're, you're saying that by me walking this way, it leads to death. And this is just selfishness and even worse than that, this is just pure defiance of God. I'm choosing to rebel from God's perfect rule in my life, and I'm going my own way. Okay, I repent from that. I turn. I turn from that, and I'm walking the way you've chosen for me, God. I'm choosing to reject my way of living, my sin. I'm choosing to reject the ways, the things that have bound me and held me before, and I'm going into a new life. Yeah, I repent, God. I choose. I want to repent of my sins. It's more than 
sorry. It's more than saying sorry, right? It's saying, God, I'm doing a new life with you now. I'm choosing to do something new. Now, yeah, those are things that we do during this, this redemption, but it's ultimately during this redemption cycle, it's ultimately because, because of the atonement and because of the regeneration that we have the power to do that to begin with, right? Because God's at work. And after that redemption point, that point where I'm saying, God, come into my life. I accept your atonement. I see it now. And I want it in me. And I repent of my ways. And I'm turning to you. There begins another stage of our salvation experience. It's called sanctification. Sanctification is basically being made into the image of Jesus. And hear this loud and clear. Sanctification is not an instantaneous thing. It does not happen over a prayer. I don't say, okay, God, now that I'm your child, sanctify me. And then I look around and go, oh, I'm sanctified now. And everything's right and everything's good. No, no. Sanctification is that whole concept of like trying to build a mountain by taking one pebble at a time there. You know, Sanctification. How do I know I'm being sanctified now? Because right now I'm in sanctification mode. How do I know? Because I'm breathing. Because I'm alive. And God takes the rest of our life to sanctify. To make us more into the image of Jesus every day. That's really why you've heard me say this joke. It's a joke, but it's the truth. And I say, you don't like me now? Hang around for five years. And five years from now, you'll probably come closer to liking me. I'll probably be a better person five years from now. Why do I say that? Because I have trust that Jesus in the next five years is going to be making me more like him than I am today. And how can you not like that if you get to experience more of Jesus in your life? You know? And so that happens all as I'm living, as I'm alive, he is sanctifying me to prepare me for the fourth stage, the fourth stage that theologians talk about, and that is glorification. Glorification. This is when I am face to face with the living God. And I'm seeing my Savior for the very first time. Guess what? How do I know glorification's kicked in? I am no longer drawing breath on this earth, but I am in his kingdom now. And he changes in the sprinkling, in the flash of an eye, because of, because of what he's done, because of what his son's done on the cross, right then, uh, when I come to him in his kingdom, I am now glorified. What, what does that mean? It means I am changed. I am convinced that glorification means a total change, a total reworking of who you are. So, I, yes, I believe that we're talking about physically God glorifies our bodies and makes them what they were originally designed to be. Uh, mentally, he, he glorifies my mental faculties. And now I can think and I have processes, cognitive processes that I only dreamed I could have had. I will finally understand college algebra at that point. Uh, I, I believe it's emotionally, oh, I'm not going to have the scars and I'm not going to have the baggage that I had because of something that, you know, my parents didn't potty train me right when I was three years old or 15 years old, whatever. Uh, you know, I'm now going to be, the emotional baggage is gone, right? And, and, and now I can em embrace other people in real community and I can experience a relationship with my father my, my holy father, my heavenly father, the way it was meant to be. And yes, it's, of course, very clearly, spiritually as well. You know, spiritually now, I am without sin at this point. I am washed totally and perfectly. And the sanctification process is no longer happening because I no longer need to be sanctified. Because God glorified me in his kingdom. And, and here's the problem. So, so there is, in a nutshell, folks... There was Theology 201 that I spent $960 to go through and three months of reading for. Okay, I gave it to you in 10 minutes time period. That, that, is, that is the process of God working within us through the salvation process. And what I believe and what I am discovering is the problem with us is that we confuse these. And we get them out of order. And we as a church will take number three, which is sanctification... And we put it as number two above redemption. And we say, okay, before God can redeem you, before God can change you, before God atones for your sin, you got to clean yourself up. you got to do some heavy lifting. And you got to get better as a person. And if you're not, he cannot redeem you. Right? Or sometimes we get in a case where we, we, sometimes we get them in the same order, but we don't, we get very unhappy with the speed of number three of sanctification. And we say, man, because I'm not growing fast enough, then I guess the redemption thing didn't work. No, it's because we're getting impatient. And we got to remember, God's got the long game in mind. 
You know, he's got eternity in mind. You and I, we're upset because, you know, I'm getting frustrated because my favorite TV show is a month from starting again or something like that, right? We're, we're short game creatures. God's a long game here. And so so we, we get frustrated with how this works. And, and Paul, Paul was ante anticipating this frustration and how we sometimes mix these up and, and say, okay, no, you've got to be sanctified before you can be redeemed. You've got, be, you got to be right and holy. And, and so I think that was part of the reason why he wrote in Titus a, a very interesting passage. And if you have a copy of scriptures, I invite you to turn to Titus chapter 2. We're going to read verse 11. Start at verse 11. He's, uh, uh, Paul's writing to this guy named Titus. Titus is a pastor. And he's given Titus some, some practical advice about how to coach people in life spir uh, on spiritual things. And he says this in verse 11. He says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared before all men. It says, It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Eager to do what is good. Now, there's several thoughts here that are interesting. First of all, uh, like if you listen to my teaching, if you heard what Pastor John said yesterday, you know, there's a part of you that just immediately repels and goes, wait a second, you're telling me that I don't have to do anything to get, to get this grace, this gift of grace in my life. I don't have to clean myself up whatsoever. And we say, yes, that's what we're telling you. And then you go, well, what about the Ten Commandments? What about going to church? What about tithing? What about all the other, the other 51 weeks of the year? Tony, did you tell me to do stuff? What about that? And I sit back and say, whoa, 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 time out. Look at what Paul said. Paul, Paul made it very clear. He made it very clear, didn't he? He says, uh, verse 12, it teaches us, the gospel is teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. So clearly, what, what the sanctification process as it's occurring, yeah, you're going to say no to some things. Yeah, you're going to have to have a change of lifestyle. Uh, yeah, you're going to start saying yes to some other things in your life that you've never done before. But here's the subtle thing that we lose. See, what John was talking about yet last week was the idea that so often we want to do those things so that we can create this exterior around us to tell everyone, hey, I've done all the hard work and i got my life right before God. You know, everything's good for me. Now, now that is that's religion and that's death according to Jesus. What, what Paul is saying here is as you experience the passion of God, as you experience the love of Jesus, it's going to teach you to say no to some old ways and some old habits. It's going to teach you to embrace some new things. But there's a difference in attitude, right? It's, I'm no longer doing this so that God will love me. It's, oh, wow. I've experienced the love of God, and I've just barely tasted it. And I, I, I'm different now, and I've got to live that out because I've experienced the difference that God has for me. So, yeah, we, we do say no to worldly passions. Why? Because he gave himself up for us, and we experience the passion. And then notice this. We're waiting. You know, uh, Titus talks about, while, or Paul talks about to Titus. Okay, so while you're waiting, you're waiting for what? You're waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, some things are happening. He's re reworking us, right? He's changing us. He, he's, he's making a difference. Why is this happening? Uh, because we're throwing ourselves, Titus's uh, listeners, Titus's the people that are, are around Titus, they're throwing themselves into the grace of Jesus, and this grace and this and, and this grace of Jesus is changing them from the inside out. From the inside out. Whereas religion, what we talked about last week, changes you from the outside, right? Religion is saying, okay, I've got to fix things around me, and I hope that, like a dam, it just holds, right? I hope it just keeps back who I really am inside, okay? But, but Jesus is changing you from the inside out. And then note the, the end product. Note the end product of this. Verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us. Redeem us, there's that word again. From all wickedness and to purify for himself a people. Purify. That, that's, we're, talking, we're talking there of uh, sanctification. Pur purify for himself a people that are his very own. To do what? Help me out, somebody. What does the verse say? The verse say? Eager. Eager to do what is good. Hey, the end product is that we are people that are eager to do good. Good for who? 
Good for what? Good, good for me. Good for me. You know, as a Christ follower, follower, I, I want to do good for me. I want. I, it's right for me to say, hey, God, I want the best things for myself. I want to experience your grace and mercy. But not just that, but also good for you. Good for you. Good for people around me. Uh, as a Christ follower, I'm saying, God, how can you use me to help other people? Uh, who else? Good, good for our communities. Good for our country. Uh, we want to be people that are salt and light in this world. Good, good for the world. Good, good for our enemies. Good for poor people. Good for wretched people. Good for sick people. Good for people that just don't have nothing. Good for people that are rich, too. You know, I want to bless the wealthy. I want to bless people that are beautiful and have all the things that this world could offer. I want to see good happen to them, too. So Paul is saying to us, hey, as we give ourselves, as we throw ourselves into the passions of God, uh, that we will, we, will, we will become people that are eager to do good. And it's no longer, well, I do good so that God might like me. It's because I've experienced all this. I can't help it. I can't help it. I want to do this stuff. So, you know, a lot of this talk today has talked, I've talked about that God has, God does the heavy lifting. God does the, the big stuff here, you know. Um, it's not about us doing and earning. So my question is, well, what is our responsibility? What is the responsibility that we have as people who have been touched by the grace of God? Where do we go with this? What do we do from here on out? Here's a discovery I've made, something that helps us know where to go from here. Passion for God, which is what we're talking about. How do you have more passion for God? Passion for God is produced by his passion on display. You want passion for God? Then you've got to be seeing his passion. Another way to say that is this. You want love for God? Love for God is created by experiencing his love for us. His love for us. Okay? So what do we got to do? Well, this is our assignment. We got to throw ourselves into the love of God. We got to throw ourselves into the passion of God. Allow that passion to be displayed before us. Because a lot of times what we do is we come to church and we do our church thing and we say, okay, again, religiously, I clock in, I clock out, I'm done with that. Now I can spend the rest of my week trying to pay my mortgage, trying to deal with my crazy kids, trying to deal with my crazy husband or my crazy wife, trying to deal with all these things around me. And I don't think about the passion of God anymore. And what we must do is not try to be better people. Could you treat, please be better? No. Could you be a person that throws yourself into the passion of God? And so one of the things that I've done to help you with this and give you some practical ideas to throw yourself into the passion of God, in your bulletin, on your bulletin back page, I, I have a thing called, I think, action points is the term we use. Action points. There's four different things that you can do. I mean, everything from taking time to memorize this passage of Scripture that we talked about in Titus. You could do that. Memorize that and commit that to heart and think about that and dwell on that this week. Or, or doing some readings. I would encourage you to do some readings uh, in the book that hopefully you all got that has our reading time and, and has devotions in there. There's some pages I directed you to and said, hey, this week, why don't you look at that? Why don't you take time to think about that and process that? Uh, if you're a person that you're sitting there saying, uh, Tony, you don't understand, man. I'm a truck driver and I would drive 70 hours a week. Well, first of all, I'm a son of a truck driver. I know that's not true because of government regulations. But you're still saying, hey, I'm crazy busy and I, I don't have time for that. Then here's, a, here's one of the points you could do. I'm going to set that right there. Go grab your little handy iPhone or your appliance that you have, you know, all your emails and stuff on. And come up here after church is over and take a picture of those flowers. Take a picture of that. And this week, put that back up on your phone and think about that. And remind yourself, Jesus will take the roads. And just by doing something like that, you're going to be drawn to the grace of Christ. As you remind, remember just that word picture, that illustration, Jesus will take the rose. Jesus will take the flower, even if the bloom is totally destroyed from it. And, and that is even just one little baby step that you can do to kind of begin seeing the passion of God in front of you. Let's pray. And Father God, we come before you. We thank you, God. We thank you for, for doing the heavy lifting. Lord, I, I thank you for, um, for the fact that you have come. You, your sacrifice atoned for our sins. God, I thank you that that your spirit regenerates, regenerates our dead life. You get us to a point where we can accept you. We can repent of our sin. And Lord, I'm so thankful to know that there are people in this room, so many people in this room that have just done that very act. And, and that they have, they have been, they bent their knee. They have surrendered their life to the throne. 
They have asked you, invited you to come into their lives. They've accepted your atoning work for them. That's the gospel. We thank you, God, for that. We thank you for making that available to us. And, Lord, my prayer is that for us, for those of us that are in that, in that realm, in that mindset, whether we're sitting here or we're somewhere on, an, on a computer in, a, in the I campus, my prayer is, God, that this week we would just we would see the display of your passion for us. And it would draw us to have deeper passion for you. That we would see your love on display. And that that would cause us to have deeper love for you. I pray that you just generate that in our hearts and lives. These things I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to invite you to just stay seated. You're welcome to stay and join with the band and sing. It might be, it might be that, that most of you, like I said, most of you have are right there on the same on the same page that I'm at as far as our walk with the Lord. But you know what? Chances are there's there's somebody in this room that's saying, Tony, all the stuff you shared with me, this is maybe the first time I've heard it. Maybe I, I've never heard about Jesus coming to this earth to die for me and that he's done it for my sins. And I want that. I want that. I, I want that in my life. Um, I'd love to talk with you more about that. I'd love to visit with you about what that means for you. And, and so... I'm going to be standing over here, and I kind of make my way out. You know, grab me during this time, or grab me after service. Or another thing, maybe you're just sitting back going, ah, I don't want to see, have everyone see walking up to you or anything like that. Then, then get your card, and write on your card, I'd like to talk with someone about, about the gospel. I'd like to talk with someone about the gospel. Put that in the note section, and give us how, how to contact you, and someone will reach you. Myself or one of the other pastors will reach you this week and visit with you about uh, about what the gospel means for you in your life. Um, I want you to take that step to visit with us about that and and how to how to how to invite how, how to invite that for yourself and own that for yourself. Let's go ahead and sing. Sing with us.
Okay, hey, our hope is that you have been blessed today. Our hope is that you've seen Christ's passion on display a little bit better today than you did uh, yesterday. And so don't forget, this week is Valentine's Day, so may you show kindness and the love of God and the passion of God to people around you. May you be a dispenser of grace. May you be a person that brings some good to this world. Go in peace, you're dismissed. Have a great week.